One point, what is more profitable than cocaine, heroin, marijuana or guns? It's illegally trafficked cigarettes. Reputable tobacco companies have for decades been complicit in cigarette smuggling and the book Dirty Tobacco, former SARS lawyer Talita Snakers, uncovers the dark underbelly of the tobacco industry. She recounts the instances where big tobacco itself was caught red-handed and explores not only why a listed company would want to smuggle its own product, but also how it was done. And she joins us uh, on the line to talk a little bit more about her book. Talita, thank you so much for your time. Hi, it's great joining you guys today. So talk to me about the inspiration and what the journey was like in putting the book together. So a few years ago, I started doing a lot of work on tobacco supply chain security. And one of the articles I came across was uh, an academic review that showed how British American tobacco had at some point made as much as 25% of its global profits from smuggling into China. And what this journal showed was um, that BAT itself had actually documented the strategy of how they were going to profit from smuggling their own packs into China. So they had legal advice, they had you know memos from their lawyers advising them how to set up tax evasion structures um, and so using BAT's own words and their own examples, we could see how they were smuggling into China. And so, of course, the question then arose, you know, if they were doing this in China, to what extent were they and the other big tobacco companies doing this in other places in the world? And then secondly, you know, how are they getting away with it? And how is it something that they haven't been taken to task for? Right. The one thing people, you know, I think we've got a, a glimpse of it when we reviewed Johan von Lochrenburg's book, uh, book's two books on when we look at uh, illicit tobacco. But just to give us a sense or a picture of how big both the legal and illicit market is. Well, you know, so the tobacco market is worth billions of rands. We know that in um, South Africa, for instance, SARS makes approximately 18 billion rand a year just from the tobacco industry. I think when it comes to illicit tobacco in particular, what makes it interesting is that around 98% of all of the illicit cigarettes on the market worldwide come from licensed, well-known, well-regulated, uh, you know, tobacco manufacturers. And the reason it's so profitable is because you make, you know, 4,200% profit on a consignment of illicit cigarettes. When it comes to the reason around smuggling, one would assume that it's for tax purposes, where you don't want to pay as much tax as you would be expected to. Is that the only reason or are there other reasons why, you know, tobacco companies would want to smuggle their cigarettes? So the biggest driver is, is arguably, you know, high tax rates and particularly where the tax rates are high compared to neighboring countries. But it's not the only reason, you know. So, um, for instance, in some countries, uh, you know, to tobacco smoking is completely prohibited. So tobacco companies might smuggle there as a way of, uh, you know, selling more product. But also we know that in many countries, and this was certainly true in a place like China, where the import duties were so expensive um, and you need a specific you know, permit to import tobacco products into the country. And so simply to gain a foothold in the local market, the companies would start smuggling. So it wasn't even about simply, you know, evading taxes. It's simply about getting a foothold in a market um, and to compare with other tobacco companies that are already established on that market. Perhaps you can give us a picture of the type of propaganda or the type of activities that some of the big tobacco companies have used in order to support their narrative. Well, so, you know, typically what the big tobacco companies like doing is to say uh, illicit trade is booming. Uh, you know, it's absolutely thriving. It's certainly something that we've seen in South Africa, where particularly the big tobacco companies would say, um, you know, SARS needs to take action against the smaller local low cost uh, tobacco companies. And look, there's absolutely no doubt that the small guys are, you know, fueling the illicit trade in, in tobacco. But for instance, what we see is that the big tobacco companies would say, you know, South Africa is the fifth biggest country in the world when it comes to illicit trade. Uh, and in fact, it's not true. There are other, you know, multiple other countries that have far higher illicit trade rates than South Africa. But the reason it's important for big tobacco to argue this is because that's how they get our law enforcement agents 
to take out their competition. So, you know, and so there are so many examples of big tobacco using narratives like that um, or saying, for instance, you know, SARS shouldn't increase the, the tax rates on um, cigarette packs because it will simply further fuel, um, you know, the illicit trade. Literally just today, um, I saw that um, BAT has sent out a letter saying that they are increasing retail prices. Again, in South Africa, for every you know, 10 cents that SARS has increased the tax rate on cigarette packs by, um, the big tobacco companies have increased their prices by 18 cents. And so every time there's a tax rate increase, the tobacco companies themselves actually, you know, profit from that. And so for a company like BAT and the other multinationals to say that tax rate increases fuel illicit trade just, you know, just seems like nonsense by Johan van Lochrenberg was quite riveting and especially when it comes to the the bits around Belinda Walters and that kind of tactics that were used but the one that kind of caught my attention was the fact that when the some of the big tobacco companies found out that you were writing this book they offered you a job so perhaps let's unpack that how did that even happen Oh, it's just one of those bizarre things, you know. So the big tobacco companies are very good at what they call, um, you know, opposition research and knowing, you know, who the people are that I think stand to expose them or uncover them. And so um, at some point I was approached, uh, you know, and asked if I would be willing to to do some work for them. And I, it, was, it was clearly meant to... Uh, you know, act as a golden, uh, golden handcuff, if you want. Um, so to secure some kind of silence. Right. I have heard it. Yeah. No, you can continue. I have heard that apparently, you know, some of the big tobacco companies are willing to pay around a hundred thousand rand a month um, for people who are willing to speak on their behalf. You know, so maybe, maybe I shouldn't have been so quick to to pass up on the offer. <laughs> All right, Talita, before I let you go quickly, what do you hope people will get out of this book? Well, I think a few things. You know, South Africans are so tired of conversations around capture and corruption. And I think South Africans also are very quick to have opinions on things. So what the book does is I think it gives us a chance to have an informed opinion and it gives us the opportunity to actually engage meaningfully in a specific area of capture and corruption um, and to force change, you know, to force change in terms of how our law enforcement agencies act. And I think to force change in terms of where we as shareholders and as investors and, you know, people with pension funds, where we choose to invest our money. Talita, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. That is Talita Snakers, who's written the book um, titled uh, Dirty Tobacco. I'll be back next week with The Alternative Investor. We do have uh, more of your news at the top of the hour. But for now, your weather details are up next.